So the first the first part of today's lecture is entitled Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry for the fact that my slides are a little bit outdated. I prepared them for the previous uh, uh, iteration of this master course, and I didn't have time unfortunately to update this. But uh, the fundamentals are the same. What is outdated is the price, some kind of metrics that change day to day, and I will. Uh, I mean. I think it's not uh, so important that I will correct myself as I So first of all, uh, let's kind of talk about generally uh, what, what is money. So you, you must be aware that Bitcoin is some kind of form of electronic money, right? You heard about it. at least something. Did you? Yeah, so this is some kind of electronic money. And uh, we have to think about what money actually is. So the three um, main functions that money uh, forms are medium of exchange. Um, that means we pay each other, like here in yours, for example, in Luxembourg, unit of account. We measure the prices, we compare prices. And store of value, if we have some savings, uh, we store them in by storing, I don't know, some savings accounts or some cash or some gold, whatever. So, um, uh, let's talk about uh, fiat money. Fiat money is this kind of um, term that is popularized by the cryptocurrency community, which means government money, the money that are issued by the government, and that they are, uh, this money is valuable just because the government says, uh, this is money, use this as money. So it's issued by government, or more precisely, we should say, issued by commercial banks uh, with the approval of the government. And the, um, the major drawback is that there is no technical measures to prevent over issuance of money. So what happens if, um, if uh, too much money is being issued, we have inflation, the prices are rising, and you cannot plan for the future because you cannot tell how much your money will be worth in one month, in, even in one day, uh, in very bad cases. Of course, in some countries, uh, the inflation is uh, steady, uh, nothing bad happens, but technically nothing prevents the government from printing uh, large amounts of money. Uh, so if we look into, into cash, uh, it has some advantages and disadvantages, and uh, we are in cryptography, of course, so in terms of cryptography, it's hard to forge um, paper notes, and it's more or less anonymous, despite the fact that the banknotes have serial numbers, and you can check those if you want, but um, generally they can be considered more or less anonymous. But of course, they are physical, and they are not suited for the internet. You can transfer them over, over the wire. Um, of course, we all have paper um, cards, and we can pay online, uh, so the main pro <laughs> is that it works online, we can pay over the internet, but of course we have some, some drawbacks of the current banking systems. So uh, do you remember the three things that information security uh, embodies? Like what are three important properties uh, that we're trying to provide? I don't know, I, I think they, they should have told you that. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, what are we trying to achieve with cryptography, with information security in general? Like, what goals? Uh, and data integrity, yeah. data uh, authenticity, and uh, authentication. Uh, yeah, so, so. More, more or less. I mean, there are uh, multiple ways to put it, but one way to put it is that it's uh, integrity, integrity, confidentiality, and availability. So, the data is, uh, is not modified when it's not uh, due to be modified, it's confidential, that means only the intended recipient read it, can, is able to read it, and availability of the data is available, but this third one is a tricky one. So in terms of integrity, uh, as we know, banks can create money as they please, in, term of, in terms of uh, informal debt, and that means that integrity is violated because we cannot, I mean, we do not know how much money will be in existence tomorrow or, or in a year. And uh, the confidentiality is um, uh, violated as well because uh, banks and payment providers can track all your payments, can check uh, like what you pay for, collect some metadata, and build your digital profile for advertising purposes, which may be not bad in itself, but still, if you want to keep your, some of your transactions private, you should not better rely on banking system. Uh, availability um, also might be violated if a bank blocks your account. For example, again, in the in a cryptocurrency community, there are many stories when people are, say, trading cryptocurrencies or starting a cryptocurrency-based business, which is totally uh, legit, it is totally legal, uh, but still the banks do not want to open their bank, uh, banking accounts, do, want, uh, do not want to do business with them because they perceive this as a risky business. Uh, so, uh, in the following um, 
maybe 10 slides or so, we will try to construct a perfect digital currency from scratch. And then, we'll, step by step, we'll come into something that resembles Bitcoin and eventually to Bitcoin. So, what we want from a perfect electronic currency is the following. So, first of all, it should better be decentralized. It means that it should not have a single point of failure. Like, if your bank closes tomorrow, if your bank just stops operating for whatever reason, it may be technical uh, crash or some hacker breaks in or whatever, uh, then your money is gone, you can accuse it. Uh, we want to ensure consistent monetary policy. We do not want a situation where some, some actor can arbitrarily change the inflation rate or some other um, important progress of the system. Uh, we uh, want, want this uh, electronic currency to be unforgeable, um, like as cryptography may provide us with the means to ensure this unforgeability. Uh, we want to make it so that it would be impossible or um, practically impossible, dif difficult to track people's transactions and that it would be also difficult to censor your transactions to prevent it from Pay to prevent you from using your money. Ideally, if, if I have some electronic money, nobody um, should be able to prevent me from spending because that actually means that I am the owner. I can spend it whenever, whenever I want. So we have some cryptographic tools at our disposal, and you might be familiar with uh, some of them. Uh, so we can use hash functions, cryptographic hash functions, to ensure integrity of the data. So if, if we calculate a hash, then if just a single bit changes in the data, the hash is also changed, and we can track this and detect that something was modified. And um, in all cryptocurrencies, hash functions are very um, wi widely used. It's one of the most important cryptographic primitives that is used in cryptocurrencies. We also can use encryption for confidentiality, but this one is uh, not so widely used in cryptocurrencies, I should say, because uh, if we have the uh, symmetric encryption, that means that some parties have to share a key. Uh, like, um, it's, it's highly not, 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 not so obvious to establish this uh, encryption um, in, in, in a blockchain system, but, but um, of course, to store my own private keys on my computer, I can use the same uh, symmetric encryption techniques that I can use, for example, to encrypt my hard disk on my computer so that nobody can uh, recover the data without the password. And of course, we use digital signatures for authentication. Um, as an example, if I make a transaction, I want to prove to everybody in the system that actually the, the money that I'm trying to spend is actually my money, and I sign it with a digital signature that, that proves that I own the private key that corresponds to this uh, particular, say, Bitcoin that I'm spending. Uh, yes, availability is also important, but it's not um, it's not so easy to, um, to ensure availability using cryptographic techniques because uh, when we talk about availability, we want to prevent the situation when some, uh, something is blocking me, something is uh, preventing me from doing a transaction, meaning that something prevents me from uh, actually issuing a network, a net network in packet, a TC packet or whatever. Uh, so this is not a cryptographic task uh, per se, but still it's an, it's an important it's an important area of security as well. So uh, we're trying now to create a better electronic currency using cryptographic means. So everybody on board so far? Okay. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, so as usually in cryptography we have Alice and Bob who wants to, in our case, they want to transact securely. And we assume that they both can generate uh, private public key pairs, which is a bit tricky because the course is called symmetric. Uh, symmetric cryptography. Uh, are you aware of the uh, of the field that is called asymmetric cryptography? <laughs> yeah, public-private key pairs, signatures. Okay, good. I, I just don't know what was in the previous class of this course. It's very nice. So, as both can generate public-private key pairs, and they uh, we assume that they both know each other's public keys. So they establish each other's identities, and they want to transact. So uh, the first an iteration, the kind of very very naive idea is just Alice sends to Bob some kind of string, uh, which says Alice gives one point to Bob and uh, signs with her uh, yeah signs with her private key and um, yeah so there must be some problems with with this approach. Okay, you know, why can't we just exchange the signed messages like I'm giving you one euro and I sign this. Is sure that it's a public key or not? 
No, no, oh, oh, uh, so, sorry. What do you mean? I'll listen with the, uh, we'll sign with the both public key. Yeah. Okay, how can we at least sure that it's both public key? No, we, we, he, here we assume that identity, I mean, yes, it's, it's a valid problem actually, uh, but we assume that we use uh, uh, difficult key exchange or something. There are cryptographic uh, ways to establish a shared, uh, a shared secret over an unsecured connection. Uh, okay, we assume that these public keys are actually their private keys that they know. Uh, but still there is uh, a major problem. If there's even many problems, I don't remember, let's see. So the problem is that Alice can produce many such things. And um, if Alice actually has one coin, she can spend this coin to pay to Bob and also pay to Charlie. And that's obviously bad because she's spending her money twice. So uh, another, another um, like one way of uh, circumventing this issue would be to add serial numbers to, uh, to coins and then the string will look like that. So Alice gives a coin with this particular number to Bob. Uh, and she adds her signature as well. Uh, but still, this is not without problems. So here in this scenario, if, if I'm the recipient, if I'm Bob, I'm receiving coin number blah 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 from Alice, and I want to be sure, uh, like for example, uh, Alice wants to buy something from me. And I'm thinking, okay, should I send her the goods or not? Is the money that I received valid or not? And in order to do so, I must make sure that Alice has not yet spent the coin with this number. Uh, and in order to do that, I have to track all serial numbers, and I have to know that this number actually belongs to Alice and has not yet been spent. So this becomes complicated uh, because like, for, for now, it, it, may, it may actually work. Uh, everybody, if Bob, um, if Bob accepts this transaction as valid, checks that money has not been spent, everybody updates their records, and the system goes on. But it also has some problems. Uh, namely, yeah, okay, we stumbled upon the same double spending issue, which is actually the, uh, the, central, um, the central problem that uh, that Bitcoin was the first, uh, the first design to solve. There were many, previously, uh, many designs of electronic currencies were proposed, which <coughs> all stumbled upon this issue and could not overcome it. How, how do we prevent Alice from creating two, two valid strings, uh, which are, both of them are valid by themselves, but they must not be valid uh, together in the same system. So, yeah, what can we do about that? Does anybody have any suggestions? H how to prevent people from spending their money two times? Tracking which coin the, uh, is ran currently or uh, which business what coins currently? Uh, yes, actually, yeah, th th that's, th that's the way. The question is, uh, who is going to track it? So, in, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a valid point. And uh, in current system, for example, the bank does this job. Uh, in the bank, they have the database and they remember who has how, how, how much money. Uh, but here, if you want to avoid this central point of failure, uh, that means that we want to somehow distribute this, this task and uh, make it independent of any single entry. Uh, so, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we have a network of nodes. So, uh, first of all, our first premise was that the system would be decentralized. It means that there will be no central authority that is in charge of running the system. So, if it, we have no central authority, that means that um, our system is, um, consists of networking nodes, like a peer-to-peer -peer network. Like, for example, a BitTorrent network, or um, I don't know some other decentralized um, system that has nodes that communicate with each other using a predefined protocol. So the general idea is that we have these nodes, and that nodes vote on which transaction to accept. So vote is also a cheap concept, and we'll go into more details about that. Uh, so obviously we have problems with that as well. So. 
how do you think we, what can be the problems if just the network I have a computer running this simple coin you have the computer and I think this transaction is valid I vote for this transaction and whichever transaction gets the most votes is, is valid what, 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 what is broken about this Okay, a hint. So uh, nodes in this naive approach are identified by their IP. Or even by their public key which they generate themselves. Doesn't matter very much. So the problem is that if they are, for example, imagine that they are um, identified by their IP address, that means that uh, an attacker can buy a million IP addresses and can outvote anyone. That means that it's called a simple attack. It is easy to create a million nodes, a million IPs, or uh, if, if the um, nodes are identified by the, their public keys, it's even simpler to generate a million public keys, whatever. Uh, the, kind of the core problem is that how do we build this system of identifying nodes which cannot be so easily uh, civil attacks, that cannot be, uh, that, can, that does not allow many entities to be created just out of thin air. So this is actually the central problem, and uh, the solution of the double spending problem boils down to this one. And uh, the funny thing is that it prevented the humanity from, created, uh, from creating decentralized digital uh, money for um, 25 years. The first, the first more or less successful um, Proposal of electronic cash was by David Chum in 1983, and this technology was later commercialized in the early 90s, but it didn't uh, become widely successful. Uh, but still, it requires some central entity to issue coins to track the ownership of coins. Uh, and then, only 25 years later, uh, Bitcoin was introduced and the problem was solved. So, uh, let's, before describing Bitcoin, before digging into, into that, Let's learn about the three basic building blocks that Bitcoin is based on, the three cryptographic primitives um, that are important for, for these constructions. And namely, these are uh, hash chains, Merkle trees, and proof of work. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, all these three primitives are based on hash functions and uh, I think nothing else. There is no encryption here and there is no uh, signatures here, only hash functions. So the first uh, building block is hash chain. So uh, a recap on hash functions, which I assume you should be familiar with. Uh, it's a function that um, produces a string of fixed length out of data of arbitrary length. It's efficiently computable and it's, it is uh, a one-way function. It's impossible, it's computationally impossible to find the pre-image of uh, the hash function. So there are multiple uh, not, not entirely equivalent, but similar definitions of, of what a one-way function exactly means. But for our purposes, we should remember only that uh, for any piece of data, it produces a unique fingerprint, and this fingerprint looks like random data, and we can assume that it behaves like random data. If we use a cryptographically secure hash function, and it's impossible to predict this output, or impossible to extract any information about the um, about the arguments of this function from the output of this function. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the first thing that we have to know. And uh, now we are starting to build what is actually called this blockchain everybody is talking about. So the blockchain is nothing, nothing more, nothing less than, ju than just ha um, blocks of some data linked by a hash function. So. In Bitcoin, we have transactions which are being uh, broadcast into the network uh, like right now, multiple times a second, I suppose. And time to time, a new block of transactions is produced. We will discuss what it means to produce a block, but let's say just recent transactions are um, put together into a data structure called a block. And then we need to ensure integrity of this construction. So um, if, say, Alice pays Bob and then Bob pays Charlie, it would be a very bad situation if uh, some data would change in the previous history and it would turn out that actually Bob did not have this money that he was spending to charge. 
So we must ensure that, uh, at least with a high probability, if something happens and if something is confirmed in, in a block, then it will not change. Uh, in order to do that, we include the hash of the previous block in the next block. So uh, this is the idea that is not uh, that was not invented by Bitcoin's inventor Satoshi Nakamoto. It existed previously, uh, and the most important property is that we cannot change any previous data without changing the latest hash, the hash of the latest block. So imagine if something, um, if some, even a single bit changed a hundred blocks ago, that means that the hash of that. Uh, one part of the block would change, and that means that the next block, which includes the hash of the previous block, would also change, and then this chain will inevitably change, and I will notice this because the, uh, the latest hash will also change. So it's an easy way to track changes and to prevent the unforeseen um, modifications of the earlier history. So, yeah, um, you, you might be also familiar with the Git version control system. Are you, by the way? Yeah, so one of the most useful uh, useful um, tools in software development. Uh, it also uses uh, a similar construction when you make a commit. Um, this uh, Git software calculates the hash of your commit, which uniquely identifies the state of the of your program in that point in time. And then when you have this um, chain of commits, which is called a branch, uh, it's actually also might be called a blockchain. Uh, at least as a data structure, it resembles blockchain, and it ensures integrity, that means that you cannot change your previous commit, at least without uh, modifying all of the um, all the next hashes in this branch. So the second important data structure is a Merkle tree, which is also built based on hash functions. So um, this is a data structure which supports two operations. So first of all, Given some data, we can create a short cryptographic digest, which looks like hashing, but internally it's not, not the same as hashing. Uh, the important property is that if we are given this digest and only a piece of original data, uh, we can check, or it would be better um, said that uh, somebody can prove to us that this piece of data was actually part of the original data the digest was calculated. So, um, yeah, do you have any suggestions on how can we build this data structure? So, if we, uh, I mean, we could use a simple hash function for this purpose, and we can could just calculate the hash of the entire data, and then if I want to, uh, like, if I want you to prove to me that this piece of data was part of the original data, you can just give me back all the original data, I will calculate the hash of everything, I will check that it matches, and it will technically satisfy these requirements. But it will be inefficient because uh, you will have to, uh, to give to me all the original data, but I'm also interested in, in one little piece of this data. And I will have to calculate the hash of the whole data while I'm, I, mean, I don't care what happens in other parts of this data set. I only want to know about my little piece of data. Okay, um, yeah, maybe kind of a hint would be, say, if, if, uh, if I have a sorted array of numbers and I want to find a specific number, uh, and a way to do it is just to scan, uh, scan the array from the beginning to the end or until I find my number, and that would be linear in the number of elements. But if I use the binary search, if I take the middle element, see if it's bigger or smaller than my number, and then choose the appropriate half, and then cut it in half, then again and again and again, I will go from linear time to logarithmic time, which is much, much better. So here we employ uh, somehow similar construction, which is called a tree for a reason, by the way. Uh, so if we have some um, amount of data, we split this data into little pieces. And we, first of all, we hash each, each element of the original data 
data set, let's say. Uh, then we hash these hashes pairwise, the 0, the 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then we proceed in this manner until we get a single hash. So we create this tree structure where hashes are hashed pairwise until we get to the top. So here, of course, I uh, should make a comment that in the simple construction we assume that the total number of elements is the power of 2. But if it's not a power of 2, we can always uh, append with some dummy value, zero values, or whatever. So we can just assume it's a power of 2. So in the end, we have a single hash, which is called the Merkle root. Uh, and it's called uh, Merkle because of the Ralph Merkle who invented this construction, famous photographer. Uh, so yeah, assuming the number of elements is 2 to the power of k. So to prove the existence, uh, the so yeah, uh, as in many protocols, we can um, we can talk about this in terms of a prover and a verifier. So uh, a prover wants to prove something and provides some evidence, say that something holds true, and the verifier does something to verify uh, if that claim is true or false. So in this scenario, a prover wants to prove that some piece of data was actually in the Merkle tree. In order to do that, the prover provides the chain of hashes that um, must be hashed together to arrive at the top of the Merkle tree. Maybe I should uh, make a picture. So if so, if we had. Um, I don't know, eight elements, we cast them together. So here is the Merkle root. So I'm asking you, uh, is it true that this element uh, belongs to a tree? So instead of providing uh, the whole information, you just say, okay, so this element you're interested in has the hash of this value. So its neighboring hash has that value. Uh, so together they hash to this value, and the neighboring hash of this value is this one. Then they hash together uh, to this value, and the neighboring value is this one, and then we arrive at the root. So I know the root, and I know the hash of my element. Then you provide me with these hashes. I hash this one together, get this. Has this together, get this, has this together, get this, and if I have the same hash as I expected to see as the Merkle root, that actually proves the membership of my element in that structure. Because of the cryptographic properties of the hash, it would be impossible for some attacker to uh, say to forge to somehow come up with hash values which are not actually in the tree, but that still hash to the Merkle root. That would be impossible because that would assume um, calculating the pre-image of the hash. So if the hash function is secure, the only way to prove the membership is actually to provide this chain of hashes. And here, um, because we have only eight elements, the, uh, uh, the performance um, is not so obvious because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven hashes. But uh, you might notice here that the number of hashes that the prover must provide is proportional to the depth of the tree. And the depth of the tree is the log base 2 of the number of elements on the lowest level. That means that if I have, say, a thousand, uh, a thousand uh, elements, then only um, about 10, or, or on every level we have two hashes, so about 20, uh, 20 hashes will be enough to prove the membership. If I have a million, um, a million elements on the base layer, that means that uh, mean 10, 20, so like 40 hashes will be enough. So uh, anyway, it's much more efficient than iterating through the whole data set. And this thing is very important for cryptocurrencies and blockchains because if I make some transaction and I want to make sure that my transaction was actually included in the data structure, um, there is a very efficient way to do that. So I may not be interested in other people's transactions, I only care about my transaction. 
And uh, yeah, this is the mechanism. Okay. And the third important building block is called proof of work. And this is actually what the um, major invention of Bitcoin was. Uh, again, it's based on hash functions. <laughs> it's always here. So imagine that we have a cryptographic hash function, say SHA-256, and we have some fixed string, named the S, and we have some random string that we can uh, put any, any value into. So if we calculate the hash of the concatenations, concatenation of these two strings, so what would be the probability that it will start with bit zero? Simple question. It's a cryptographic hash function, so it behaves as random oracle, we can say, so the data is random. One over two. Yes, it's one half. So, uh, what if we are looking for the strings that start with two zero bits? What, what would it be? One over three. Yeah. And with ten zero bits? One over one thousand twenty four. So, this is some kind of cryptographic puzzle that is very useful because we can uh, adjust its difficulty by adjusting the value of k. Or just if we, uh, even, even like more general, if we are hashing some random data and we so say this is the interval of all possible values for a hash function, say it's from 0 to 2 to the 256, and uh, if we set some threshold, say here, that means that the probability that a hash of some random value will fall into this region will be, I don't know, 10%, and here it will be 90%. And by adjusting this target, we can I mean, we can put it anywhere, we can make the probability of falling into this region as small as we want or as large as we want. And this is very useful in the following construction. Uh, we can use this hash puzzle to prove that some computational work has been done. So, if the hash function is unpredictable, it's cryptographically secure, and the, uh, the only way to solve this puzzle is actually by trying um, arbitrary random data. And until, until we find the hash value with the desired properties. And if I manage to find such random n that, oh, sorry, that this hash actually hashes to, uh, say, the value with k zero bits in the beginning, in that manner I can prove to you that I really did the computational work and calculated somewhere on the order of 2 to the k hashes. Of course, this is all probabilistic, and I can be lucky, I can just uh, stumble upon this lucky hash on my first try, but the probability is very, very low. Uh, the, expected, um, the expected number of um, hash evaluations that I have to perform to find the string with k and zeros is due to the k. And here we come to Bitcoin. All these three constructions, the hash chain, the Merkle tree, and the proof of work are combined in Bitcoin so that we have a working decentralized digital currency. So this is how it looks like in one slide. So we have blocks and we have transactions. So these are the transactions that people make. I send you some money, I sign this with my signature, this is my transaction. The transactions are combined into the Merkle tree and the root of this Merkle tree is included in a block. A block is a data structure that uh, contains the root of the transaction tree, um, the timestamp, some other, um, other additional information, and it contains the hash of the previous block, which makes it a hash chain or you can say a blockchain. That makes the, the tampering of the previous transactions impossible or better say detectable. If I change something in some previous block, say I change something here, that means that these hashes will change, this will change, the hash of the block will change, and the hash of the next block will change, everything will change. So, uh, this construction provides integrity, and what's more important, the hash of the block must, uh, must be, um, I think it would be more accurate here to say, must be lower than some target value, 
Uh, but the idea is that blocks are only considered valid if they have this proof of work attached to them. That means that this uh, nonce value, which is actually an arbitrary number, it doesn't mean anything. Um, it is just used to, um, to iterate through with random values until the hash of this whole construction would be lower than some threshold. That would prove that some work was done to produce this block. So where does it lead us? Um, it leads us to the following important question. And I think I will have to wrap up soon because we don't have time, we'll go and move to Ethereum. But the important thing is, why would users bother validating each other's transactions? So more generally, like this blockchain construction, so who actually does the work? Who produces this blockchain? So if we want to avoid any central party, that means that the users themselves should do it, right? But the question is, um, what motivates? Uh, hmm? Some for it? Uh, yes, yes. That's actually uh, that's actually the answer to the question. They have the reward. So the brilliant idea, which puts this all together, is that by producing a block, by finding this hash value with a low enough uh, with a low enough value. Um, the user who solves this puzzle gets a reward. Uh, that means that every block includes a transaction which generates new bitcoins from nowhere and assigns them as a reward to the, uh, to the user who found the block. And this reward is the only issues, issuance mechanism in bitcoin. There is no way new bitcoins can be created other than by this process, which is called mining, by the way, because uh, it is uh, it resembles the process of mining gold from the ground. You spend some work, you dig into the ground, and then you um, you get something precious out of it. Uh, so I think that we will stop now and make a short break. And I will continue, um, continue this presentation in two weeks. And now after the break, we'll move, we will move on to Ethereum which is another blockchain system and which the homework assignment will be based upon. So, uh, five minutes later.